Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so uh, my name is Miles. I'm from Fusion Party. And uh, with me, I've got Owen as well, also on the uh, National Leg Sack. We, um, the, we've, our big, our big item tonight is a workshop that I put together to run on decision tree mapping which is a pretty exciting rationalist technique, which I'd love to talk about. And I'll talk your ear off later. But um, I want to give a few other people a chance to talk first before we jump into that. Um, so to give a quick update on, on party activities, we've had, um, we're in the midst of a couple of big camp, a couple of campaigns. We've actually just finished one in, um, in uh, Dunkley. Yeah. In Dunkley, yes. Uh, Owen, would you like to say a few words about that? Yeah, so um, we were helping out the Democrats. Um, I guess everyone's familiar with them. They've been around a while. Um, it, it's a shame that, you know, they've sort of fallen out of the public spotlight a bit. Um, but, you know, their values are still closely aligned. And, um, yeah, so in the election on Saturday, uh, it was Labour before. It stayed Labour again with a swing of only 4% against them. Um, in by-elections, it's typical for the government to lose 5% as a swing. So this is still, you know, favourable to lay labour. But, um, you know, as we mentioned in the newsletter um, just one year ago in Aston, um, instead of this typical 5% against the government, it was actually towards the government, a swing of um, 9% or so. So, you know, labour is definitely um, becoming less popular in Australia. But um, unfortunately, yeah, the, one of the one of the things we noticed in the, the polls for Dunkley, 80% of people voted for Liberal or Labor, and then um, another 4% or so for the informal votes. So um, with those sorts of seats, um, like I, I saw it on the ground as well. I, I was there handing out the flyers. Um, just if, if I compared it to my experience in Aston, um, obviously I'm going to be more enthusiastic giving out flyers like as the candidate. Oh, but I've, I've done it at other ones as well. Um, but yeah, I noticed on Saturday, these people just absolutely uninterested in taking the flyers. Um, they'd already made up their minds. Um, fewer people talking to me um, or just, you know, the um, the volunteers in general. There just seemed to be um, just disinterest in politics, in, um, yeah, in thinking too much about um, how their vote's going to go. So um yeah, pretty disappointing. I, I would recommend, um, I don't know, Mars, if you would recommend the same, but if we're thinking about running candidates, if we look at past results and see it's just absolutely Liberal Labour, no one else gets a look in, then I would recommend, you know, don't waste the money, don't risk burning out the volunteers. Um, we should really only be looking at electorates where, I don't know, the other parties are getting at least 30% combined. Um because, yeah, here it's just, you know, you see on the signs as well, you know, what's a face woman will be a strong voice. The other guy will get things done. Just, you know, completely vague. Um, you know, what was the Liberals policy the other day? Just um, nuclear, yeah. Uh, Daryl, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, were they brushing past the um, Liberals and Labour as well, um, taking no uh, votes from them? Or... I got the impression the people at my booth, they seem to have made up their minds that they love Labour. and Yeah, that's it. But had they taken how to vote votes from cards from Labor? Um, yeah, they were. They often, you know, brushed past the other people. Sort of, don't talk to me, and then, um, you know, all smiles when they see the Labor people. Yeah, right. Yeah. What booth were you at? Uh, this was Seaford East. So here we got um, we got two percent, which was good compared to the average of one point six for the Democrats. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, th that is something positive at least that, you know, it, it shows that us turning up at booths, it, it's not completely for waste. It does have an effect. Um, I guess it, it's also a bit of a negative in that I wish voters would put in proper research into where their vote should go that, you know, nobody is really able to sway them in the last five seconds. <laughs> but, oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, we had, um, uh, from what I, I think we put together four volunteers from what I can tell. Um, uh, yeah, sounds right. yeah. And, uh, most of them traveled from outside of the electorate. So that's pretty good effort, I think, to show, um, show support for the campaign, given also that it was a, uh, Oz Democrats, Heath McKenzie, the candidate, 
which we um we partnered with and so it's kind of in the spirit of fusion that we work with uh different different groups who align with us where where we can and um where there's common ground to be had so oh yeah actually i think uh, one one last thing i want to note about that um so the victorian socialists you see all their branding it's you know black and gray like um very um depressing and um so yeah simon wanted um simon wants to change our branding a bit our shirts it's um a, a black shirt with a white fusion logo or sort of gray and so um you know simon was saying he was actually mistaken for socialists during the day and i guess either way it's not um it's not putting our best foot forward if you compare the libertarians they had um they had a tie-dye shirt can you imagine like a yellow base with bright uh teal bright magenta um and similarly for for the election poster itself it's got uh Kristen with uh, a ponytail in her head mm. and then um it had like you know pink light blue uh all sort of like vaporwave sort of aesthetic um and i, I guess I, I wouldn't encourage that exactly it, it's not you know the language of power um, if you think like I want my local member speaking to the prime minister on my behalf and you see like, you know, Kristen having a good time with cool colors, it's like, yeah, I mean, she looks like a nice person, but you know, do I want her as my representative to the prime minister? I'm like, oh, probably not. Um, but at least, you know, it, it gets noticed um, versus um, unfortunately the Democrats stuff. I just found their branding. So just boring. Um, yeah. And I don't want us to do the same. It's actually, it's pretty effective. And I, I agree that you're right, um, you and Simon, that it's eye-catching. And what we'd want to do is have it so that it's uh, cohesive colors. I think the libertarian colors was clashing uh, and kind of like, so sure it was eye-catching, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's aesthetically appealing. So like when you ran in Aston, we had we had bright pink colors everywhere, which was super mm -hmm. effective with, with kind of like purple highlights and a mix of other colors thrown in. But the pink and the purple contributed really well and yeah i really like that um yeah and and in the graphic design as well it wasn't just sort of colors mashed together like the libertarians did um from what i saw it looked like they just threw in colors randomly it didn't look like it was particularly coordinated whereas in aston it was, we, it was obviously like we were thinking about the space and the allocation so um so, so like the simplest thing to say is just everyone wear pink or everyone wear purple and uh and and, and that's that's really easy it's really memorable for volunteers and really visible as well. And that's that's something that's incredibly effective when we have this bright color aligned identity. Purple in particular, I think works really nicely. Yeah, oh, so yeah, see that shirt, like yeah, it's, literally, this was the, yeah. it's literally tie dye. Um mm. so yeah. So, you know, like like you might like tie dye, you might not, but I it's eye catching. <laughs> It's very eye catching. Yeah. It, it stands out. But yeah, as you said, like the balance of like business and kind of eye catching, you have to get that that balance because that as you said, like, do you really want someone who looks like that walking into the PM? Probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you do you ordinarily have your hair pink anyway, Owen, if if you do that. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah. So, you know, you're already you know, uh, on I... that train, so to speak. Yeah, I noticed actually a bit. Um, so you know, I I moved back from New York in um, the end of two thousand and two. Oh, sorry, twenty twenty two. So the Aston campaign was, um, I think, like basically four months afterwards. And so um, I guess you guys would see. Oh, I, I work as a software engineer, and you know, in you know Silicon Valley, those sorts of places, you, you're basically not allowed to wear a suit. People would think you're a limo driver or something. Um, and so you know, I was used to you know wearing yeah. t shirts and that everywhere. Versus in Aston, um, I said something about like, um, you know, I'll make Aston rich and happy. And this guy says to me, well, how come you aren't rich? <laughs> and I say, well, you, you, you know, nothing yeah. about me. Like, I don't know why you're making this assumption. I mean, I, I can only guess, you know, the clothes and all that. I was wearing a t-shirt. Um, so mm. I guess, yeah, it's, I, I have to, you know, you see the Pacific Islanders as well. You know, they're, they're wearing like a, you know, some sort of, um, skirt made of you know straw and things but then on the top they've got you know a business shirt the tie and it's like that must be so hot and sweaty and impractical in tonga but you know they want to be taken seriously if they're going to be the president and go to the un they don't want 
like you know a, a photo leaked oh well a photo was shown recently of anthony albanese wearing like you know a hawaiian shirt and you know the lay and all this and it says you know why is he you know airbus albo why is he taking all these vacations and then you know the other half of the picture comes out and he's standing next to the president of, you know, Tuvalu or somewhere wearing the same outfit. <laughs> and, you know, he, it's, he's not on holiday. He's, he's wearing, you know, the clothes of power and Tuvalu, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, there's that thing, you know, you can't, you can't dress in your own culture. You have to dress the culture, like where you want that approval sort of thing. And so, yeah, next time, if I run yeah. again, I'm definitely going to wear suits. Yeah. Yeah, the Silicon Valley billionaire doesn't wear a suit because the people who work for him as lawyers wear a suit. Mm. It's funny. I saw um, a picture of uh, Sam Bankman Freed. It said, um, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. And, you know, he was in some, you know, gorgeous villa wearing the uh, um, the T-shirt and the, the, the shorts. And then, yeah. And sandals. Then it, yeah. Then it cuts away. He's in prison wearing a T-shirt and shorts. <laughs> hmm. so. Anyway, um, yeah, so Miles, I think we agree that um, brighter uh, clothing at the next election. But also, um, I think maybe Simon's maybe overemphasizing the importance of clothing. You know, as I said before, um, by two of us turning up at this particular booth and handing out flyers, you know, we only managed to boost the vote from 1.6 to 2%. And um, someone, like yeah, someone managed to get to 10% for the Dems. I don't know what their trick was. I'm not sure if it was Heath, but um, either way. So it, it can have a massive effect. And when my mother handed out for me, she boosted it from, you know, 3% overall to 5%. Mm. Um, she was making sure everyone got one of those flyers. But still, you know, this big effect we're talking about, maybe 8%, you know, that's not going to win us an election. Before people go to the booth, they need to have heard of us. They need to know our policies. Um, and so that's why I'm much more focused on things before election day. Yeah. Yeah. Alexandra Casio Cortez, the new yeah. in New York. Yeah. She said she wore out like three pairs of shoes. She <laughs> has this photo with the three worn out pairs of shoes. Um, like door knocking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she, she physically visited so many people. It worked for the Greens in Brisbane. That's my understanding, Miles. Well, Jonathan Sri seems to be almost a um, you know contender for mayor. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if he gets elected. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of it's kind of an open thing. Um, I don't think I don't think he's polling quite well enough to get it this time. Uh, it's still heavily liberal dominated council, but even just the act of campaigning is going to grow the presence and awareness of the Greens significantly. Um, AOC, she's a uh, New York based, mm. yeah, rep for 14th district. I wish we had the kind of residential density that New York does. <laughs> it would be great. Yeah. Oh, keep yeah. in mind as well, people are more used to, um, you know, if she knocks on a door in a busy area, you know, likelihood they just don't answer her <laughs> versus, just, yeah, like more spread out. You might actually talk to people coming. Yeah. I'm pretty mm. sure the story is real. I don't have any reason to disbelieve it, but, um, oh, I believe it. Yeah. Yeah, point taken about the relative distance in Brisbane. So let's uh let, let's let's um talk a little bit about now about the Nala by election, which is the other one we've got going on. So Dunkley finished on Saturday. That was the election day. And Inala is on March 16th. So we've uh, pre-polling has just opened and we've got a couple of weeks of this before we get into it. So we're partnering uh in with the with this the Queensland branch of the Australian Progressives. Here in Queensland, Inala is uh, south, very close south of Brisbane, nestling just under it. And um, the progressive candidate, Ed Carroll, he's running primarily on a platform of youth justice reform, but he's also heavily supportive of a range of other things, such as um, strong on climate change, uh, drug reform policies, and um, in, in strong alignment with a lot of fusion policies as well. He's really interested by our 800% renewables target, for example. So we've had uh, we've had a couple of events with him. He's been to he's been hitting the campaign trail pretty hard. Um, highlight was probably the Youth Justice Forum we held last week to um, speak to lived experience advocates and youth justice advocates and organisers working in this space around uh, improving improving outcomes using evidence based approaches. Which uh, I think the out that the the outcome from the panel, the consensus of the panel, which they really stressed, was that it's about forming uh, forming relationships with young people 
in order to uh, not not even sort of like get that early intervention, but you're already you already have them immersed in this pro-social environment where it's clear that you know people have outcomes, have positive outcomes, and they have people who support them. And before um, b- before people start going down that route of into into the justice system, into the jail system, which will keep them coming back or keep bringing them back rather. Uh, we have a couple of volunteers here with us in the meeting who've been involved in that campaign. Do any of you guys want to say a few words about Ed or your experience? Uh, yeah, I will. So we held, as Mel said, we did the Youth Justice uh, Forum last week. It's available on YouTube if you anyone wanted to have a look at it. We had some really great speakers um, that had, as Mel said, the lived experience um, and who worked uh, heavily. Um, some great audience members asking some really uh hard hitting questions as well, which was great. It was a real, uh, it was less of a people sitting up the front end telling everyone. It was more of a, like a real round table discussion, which was um, really refreshing to see. It was, was awesome. Um, yeah, it's amazing. He's uh, very passionate. He's lived in the area for a while uh, since he was a teenager. Um, this is a Anastasia Palaszczuk, former Queensland Premier's uh, seat that she held for quite a long time. So um, it's, seem to be a low socioeconomic area, um, which is kind of why the, the youth justice is so important to Ed because he's kind of grown up with it. Um, so, yeah, we had that last week. Um, I hope, I think we've got some volunteers for on the day. Um, there's a few booths that we wanted to target, uh, that which we've been talking to Ed about. And I believe Daryl's been putting up some core flutes around as well on his travels. Um, no, I volunteered to do that, but oh, um, so far has not happened. Oh, okay. Um, I gave a little bit of money to them, but... Um, oh, okay. So, uh, I'm willing to. Yeah. I'm willing to help. It's just I have limited time. Yeah, no, it's understandable. Um, it's, I think he's used to doing things by himself, so he's been really mm. grateful for our uh, help, but he's kind of doesn't know kind of what to do with us sometimes so um yeah we've just jumped in and and helped where we can which has uh been great so um yeah ed's Mm. focus uh as once he gets through because he's the head of the queensland branch of the australian progressives is to then focus on uh the state government so um that election coming up so that's his his real focus it's trying to build the progressive up as a bit of a brand um and yeah lovely guy Mm. and we align really closely with him on a lot of things so it's been good Awesome. Well, there's a few elections coming up for people who are looking for a job to do. We are always interested in contesting elections, always looking for candidates who are interested in running election as well. And the best way to get us a contest election is to say that you want to be a candidate. So if anyone is listening to this or watching back later, um, we run regular candidate information sessions, letting you know what's involved, what the um, um, what the kind of process is and how we'll take you through that as well. Uh, the, but the, the the sort of nuts and bolts of it is that we need to have a candidate to build a campaign around and we want candidates because we want campaigns. So every uh, every few months we'll run a candidate info session. There's one coming up very shortly. I believe it's in, uh, oh, actually I pushed it back. I think it might be in next month. I think it's not till May. Yeah. May, yes, yeah. So, um, so RSVP to that and if there's enough interest, we can run one sooner as well. If not, have a look at elections near you. So, uh, in October is the Victorian Council's election, which we will definitely be running a campaign in, in the um, city of Yarra, in inner Melbourne. In, set, uh, or I want to say September, there is the Queensland State election, which will also be, uh, most will almost certainly be running a candidate. And uh, there's a good chance we'll support Ed for that one as well. And then there's the also the New South Wales Council elections are coming up at the end of the year. And I believe they're in October, uh, I think. September, no, they're in September, okay. And so there's going to be, uh, there's additional elections all around Australia as well, which happen, there's by-elections. So there's a high chance that there'll be an election coming up near you. But um, we we do support interstate. We do work together closely across the entire country. So you, you won't be alone. There will be volunteers, uh, both in person, and uh, and and remotely as well, giving you guidance and support and mentoring and taking you through the steps. And uh, we run regular volunteer inductions as well every month to look at the main roles. So yeah, excited and exciting. We live in interesting times. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Owen? 
Uh, yeah, in terms of being a candidate, I guess it would be, uh, I'd be curious to know what everyone's reluctance is. I know that, um, you know, for government jobs, for instance, there's some um, problems there. Um, for me, I guess my biggest reluctance in, um, you know, I, when I was thinking like, should I be a candidate? The biggest thing holding me back was um, I felt I'm not an expert in everything. You know, how can I say that I alone have this vision for how Australia should be run. Um, but then I guess, you know, I, I was thinking um, it, it's not stopping the current people. <laughs> you know, if we look at the current <laughs> Labor and Labor politicians, like, Pretty you know, I often, yeah, I often criticise them for, you know, like, why do you fuck this up and all this? And, you know, they just seem not that interested in doing the right thing. You know, they're just there to, I guess, you know, set up a job for afterwards, a revolving door, Um fundamentally they're in power because they're the best at winning elections not because they're you know they have the best ideas or anything and so figured yeah like if, if all these other people you know they're not experts either and they're doing it and um yeah in the end you know i was worried about like what if i look like an idiot at a debate well i guess the debates didn't happen <laughs> but i think that's partly because it's a by-election um everything came together mm -hmm. quickly and um there was uh there was a potential for one debate it was going to be the um the christian forum i forget if that's what they're called um but you know basically hardcore christians um the australian christian lobby yeah that's right and um so i said yes so did one of the, the libertarian candidate and then they ended up cancelling it on the basis that um liberal and labor didn't say yes and so talking to these other people well that's a complete waste of time <laughs> and i told them well how are yeah. you ever how's anyone ever going to take you seriously if you know we're prepared to listen to you and then you publicly say that, oh, no, it doesn't matter if, you know, Owen and Mayer listen to you. Like, you know, who cares about those people? <laughs> well, they're the yeah. ACL. I mean, aren't they with the, the sort of the Liberal Party's, you know, well, yeah. hands so, up like, the Liberal Party puppet? They ended up saying that basically, you know, they're still fond of Liberal and Labor. <laughs> and But isn't it a shame they didn't listen to us? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah this is how to get some people's endorsement just you know treat them like shit <laughs> we should try copying that tactic miles we should just proactively message a whole bunch of groups like hey we're not going to turn up to your meeting <laughs> fuck you <laughs> and then by negging they just... us. <laughs> yeah neg them like um you know, pick up artists <laughs> exactly yeah. um so yeah anyway uh, yeah you guys said, aren't good enough to vote for us yeah <laughs> So um yeah, what I'm trying to say is like don't don't be too scared about being a candidate. Like, you know, can you if you think about the odds, what are the chances that someone less competent, less able than you has already put up their hand? And so, you know, you one of the reasons of putting up your hand as a candidate is to stop these people to um, you know, to keep lifting the bar. That kind of um like I'm very sorry, this is Amanda, I had to switch to my phone because I need to cook dinner for my children. Oh, no worries. Um, that's the thing, exactly those points that you've touched on there is the thing that would stop me. Like I would love to run for the Senate, but a, I'm heavily tattooed. Like that could be an issue for a whole lot of people for a whole lot of reasons. Um, yeah. like the, the appearance, I, I'm a COO of a software company. I have oh, okay. a, a good job. I'm just heavily tattooed and I have multicolored hair and that sort of stuff. So, um, I think, you know, that automatically counts against me the minute that you see me there's a lot of people that just judge me straight away only um, for some demographics i mean some demographics are going to appreciate it yeah and that's and that's kind of the the balance like i know a lot of people will go okay well she doesn't give a shit what everyone looks like um she speaks her mind uh she you know dresses the way she wants to dress it can see be seen as a good thing for a younger demographic but um, the older demographic, like it just basically rules them out straight away, including my parents. <laughs> um, but yeah. the other thing that you said uh, also, like the looking like an idiot, then I see, see see people like, you know, Jackie Lambie went in with no experience whatsoever um, and has simultaneously looked a little bit daft but also got some shit done. So, like. She's it's, the most it's, passionate, it seems. Yeah, she is. The, and yeah. she's, she's come in there for a real reason. And um, I think if you've got that drive for it, even if it's a particular single, like, subject that you really want to hit home on, um, you just hit home on that one. So, yeah, like, yeah. Um, 
it's it's a daunting prospect um to do it because I don't know how I'll cope with seeing like you know you just look at reddit and you see the amount of shit that people get it can be quite disheartening and quite personal um with yeah. that sort of stuff yeah i i want I, I agree with your point there were i had two reddit sessions and yeah one of them i was so pleased with um I, you know the people loved me they did lots of upvotes but then the second one i don't know what it was i was saying the same sorts of things but yeah people hated it um i wouldn't be too upset about that but um I do agree with your point, Amanda, that like you have to have a tough skin, that's for sure. Yeah. But um on on your point about the image and you know the tats and things, um, I, I would lean towards Daryl's perspective that, you know, for some people it appeals to them. And I remember um Andrea Leong, our former secretary, she um I remember her making the emphasis that we we can't appeal to everyone. We have yeah. to pick some sort of target. And yes. um, you know, Miles and I would both agree that you know if we focus on like um futuristic technology to solve lots of problems and you know treating climate change as an emergency if we just focus on those two issues we're completely unique in the political landscape no one else has anything intelligent to say about ai or you know how software is going to affect us um and work from you know work from mm. home is a huge i think oh yeah potential you know yeah, if somebody it's... wants to push that yeah, well, you know, like we, we ended up with, you know, bad internet because, you know, Rupert Murdoch, want, you know, wanted to keep selling newspapers and, you know, Foxtel. So, like, you know, Netflix would be competing with him. So, you know, let's have slow internet. And, you know, the liberal puppets played along with it. Hmm. Um, yeah. But you're better off. It's a marketing principle. You're better off with, you know, 25% absolutely love you and 10% absolutely hate you than 50% think you're sort of okay and 50% think you sort of suck. You know, mm. it's you're better off with raving fans who will go way out of their way to help you. Yeah. And even the 10%, if they're an unpleasant 10% of the population, you know, if neo-Nazis, homophobes, etc., are, you know, lambasting you, this is actually attractive to quite a lot of people. Mm. Yeah. it's When you're the, the target of um a lot of, like, those real fuck with um then people kind of start to support you by proxy it's like oh well the, if the nazis don't like her she must be all right sort of thing but yeah i can definitely <laughs> handle the i can handle the 10 percent um probably like i get into many an online debate and that sort of stuff it's just i don't know i don't know it's just that's the it's just holding me back a little bit so so in in this uh workshop i prepared we'll look at exactly how to approach this kind of problem and uh and and look at look at it in sort of a numbers based way so it's given it's about half past six and there's quite a lot of content here which i am um, starting to doubt we'll be able to get through i wouldn't mind cracking on uh if that's okay with everyone awesome yeah so what i'll do is i'll put a link to the slides in chat and then i'll do a screen share there we go and uh, there's a link. So decision tree mapping, if anyone is, and, and, and jump on the link as well if anyone wants to follow along. So this is an interactive workshop. So there are a few uh, sort of exercises along the way. Uh, what what I've what I've prepared is, um, I mean, obviously start with a bit of intro philosophy, but then looking at a few different sort of techniques which lead into it. And then the main technique of decision tree mapping is a little bit longer and more complex. And uh, essentially, it's a way to make decisions using a, a very rational approach. So you, you can sort of look at it as making predictions in a certain sense, but it's probably better to look at it as helping you to make decisions and be more confident in your decisions or make just make better decisions. So there's a few sort of important terms here. Uh, we often talk about rationalism or evidence-based policy. Uh, and so the... The, the terms there to sort of simplify the meanings. Empiricism is, is this idea which started in the, in the early Enlightenment, sort of 16th century kind of deal, 17th century, which is all about observing patterns in the world. They're making predictions off those patterns. So it's kind of the sort of the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental underlying bases of the scientific method. But something a lot of people don't realize, the modern scientific method is actually quite a bit more complex than this. It's actually somewhat different. And so we don't, we don't really apply raw empiricism anymore in research. And we, we have much 
it's more and more complex and involved methods, admittedly, but much more um, what what turns out to be more accurate methods. So rationalism is subtly different in that it's essentially an argument which follows a logical train of thought. Like um, essentially you you follow the numerical calculations, you follow the numbers, and then there's very clear one outcome, two outcome, one outcome is better, one outcome is worse, one is true, one is false. That's rationalism. And and so the important distinction to make here is that you um, if you start with, if your initial starting conditions for a rational argument are wrong, then your argument can be correct, but you can have a bad outcome. And that's a really important thing to, and a really subtle distinction to make as well, that you might start with a, a certain assumption or set of assumptions, and maybe there's some subtle issues with those assumptions, and you might have a perfectly rational, sensible argument, but your outcome is is just is just not helpful or actively actively harmful because those assumptions you started with are incorrect. So a, a, a really nice simple example would be, um, you know, uh, let's say let's say the sky is green and you be like, and um, you see green light coming through your window and you're like, oh, it must be daytime because I believe the sky is green. I see green light coming through, and like that's that's a perfectly rational argument. And you would be right if the sky was green, but the sky isn't green usually unless you're under aurora borealis you know in which case then yeah that is a perfectly rational argument you're under aurora borealis your aurora borealis is out so at this it, time of year in this room <laughs> in the kitchen yeah. well what about libertarianism as an example you know dispense with the value of social connection and it's perfectly logical sure yeah and then so I, i'm simplifying things enormously here and we can go hugely to detail discussing the philosophy of it but the point of this workshop tonight is to look at the point number four which is applied rationalism where we're kind of gonna basically skip over all the kind of spooky theory and philosophy and get right to the fun part which is how can we actually use it to make our lives better um point number three is kind of important because it's kind of it's the big thing which happened in the early 20th century where we realized that empiricism and rationalism we need to go more than that we can't just use these by themselves the ancient greeks essentially used these two and a half thousand years ago and it got them just short of steam engines and not even that barely and so um essentially the problem of induction is that we can look at patterns in the world but that's um that's not proof that those patterns will continue so the classic example is we can see the sunrise in the morning be like okay yeah the sun rose for the last thousands and thousands of years so we might expect it to keep rising but we don't actually have proof that the sun is going to rise and and part of that is is that we don't um, like we're looking at the pattern we're not actually looking at why the sun is rising you know so um so that kind of led to this whole revolution in science there's a whole other thing pretty exciting but um oh actually miles that point it. reminds me a lot of um you know when you speak to the climate deniers they say you know it's a similar train of thought for them you know the weather's always been fine you know what are you complaining about yeah. exactly yeah exactly it's a it, it's a logical fallacy more or less and um a guy called david hume who's fairly famous philosopher of science came up with this this earth-shattering criticism of the conventional enlightenment philosophy and so we had to sort of um figure things out for a while so uh let's let's jump in and look at a case study to open this next one up and give me a sec just to find my notes desperately turning pages okay so uh the uh the sphex wasp it's a genus of wasp and for many years um, they've been used as an example for a uh, really what was considered a touchstone in cognitive science. Um, typically, when it comes time for egg laying, the Sphex wasp will build a burrow and fill it with paralyzed insects for their future larvae to eat, uh, which is, you know, we, we can probably think of a few insects that act like that. But, um, but the Sphex wasp was special because what she would do is when hunting, she will sting her prey, wait for the venom to take effect, drag the prey back to the burrow entrance, leave it outside, and then the wasp will go into the burrow and check for predators or or leaks or anything, and then come back out and drag the uh, the cocooned prey inside. And so um, this sequence of actions is elaborate, organized, and complex, and on the surface seems to indicate an impressive level of mental sophistication, considering the insect's brain weighs less than a milligram. Uh, however, in 1879, a French entomologist called Jean-Henri Fabre decided to dig deeper, and uh, to sort of summarize the notes, what he did was the um, he waited until the Sphex wasp came with prey to the burrow and 
left the prey outside and went inside. Then what he did was he he got the cocoon prey and moved it a few inches away from the burrow. And then when the wasp came out, it gave a little cry and grabbed the prey and dragged it back outside the burrow. And then the wasp went back inside the burrow, leaving the prey outside. And um, in the notes here, this uh, this entomologist apparently did that 40 times, repeated that 40 times. And each time the wasp would drag the um like it would drag the the prey back and go back inside to check it come back out again which is which is clearly redundant and pointless so mm. so what what this experiment showed was that, and, and um sort of sort of generalizing here it, it, uh, but what this experiment showed was that you you can have you can essentially cheat and develop very complex dynamic strategies by using a fairly simple algorithmic process which doesn't need large amounts of cognition, large amounts of planning, large amounts of focus and attention. And, uh, and so obviously in this case, there was a, um, the algorithm broke. <laughs> and, and so here the, the wasp would have had to adjust. And apparently some research found that the wasps and other species could adjust uh, eventually after a while, but, um, but we can essentially analogous to this, we can use a very simple set of sort of conditions and triggers in order to actually develop fairly complicated sets of behavior so so this first example is called the trigger action pattern and essentially it's a it's a thing we've observed in behavioral science where there's all these kind of heuristics running uh, on the human subconscious where uh, ingrained patterns where something will trigger us to do something and so some examples here it's a bowl of chips in front of you you'll go out and grab one and then you'll eat it it's kind of instinctual right it's sort of below cognitive processing um some really really common ones these days is you might hear a buzz or a ping be like oh is that my phone making a noise or if there's a quiet moment of conversation, you're at a party, you might like pull out your phone and check your messages. It's just sort of like this instinctive action that happens in response to a trigger. So really, really common. Um, let's take a quick moment to, hey, your turn at home. Uh, everyone, what I get everyone to do is take a minute and just write down some trigger action patterns that occur in your lives, just so we can uh, have, have a bit of a think about it and have an example. And then if anyone's brave enough, we can we can share them. And and for hard mode as well, try and choose an example which is not some some things which are not here on the slide. Okay, pretty simple then. I've got a couple of examples here. How's everyone else going? You got a, a we've got a few sort of trigger action patterns. Yeah, does anyone feel brave enough to share? Yeah, I'm well. Please. Um, yeah, so I was never formally diagnosed. I mean, my generation are kind of a bit before all that and we're treated as behavioral problems. Um, but, it, you know, I have enough sort of ADHD um, inattentive characteristics that I've had to build these habits kind of habits whatever i do if i do it multiple times i turn it into a habit intentionally um things like you know packing up i always pack up my trailer at the end of the day i, I work as a mobile dog washer and um were i to forget um i i have in the past you know driven off with the ramp still down and or you know have failed to lock the trailer or, or something like that so i've got this step by step process and much like your wasp if i'm interrupted it does cause me some consternation i have to go back to the beginning and follow the whole process even just checking that i did you know so it's it's for me it's a survival characteristic it's, some of this stuff is um very fundamental yeah so um so so some examples that i wrote down was uh when i walk past my kitchen i'll uh i'll instinctively go to the fridge and open it and look for snacks that's something that happens to me if i need if i'm near my fridge i'm like i want to open it and i sort of as, as i started thinking about it i'm like it's not just sort of the the desire for snacks it's also a nice burst of cold air 
but that that's also like that feels good to me and if you've ever been to queensland or brisbane you'll know why that's so nice uh another one is i'll when i walk into my bedroom i forget after a long day i want to take my shoes off sit down take my shoes off so like trigger the action um, the third one I got was like, when I get in my car, I'll I'll go to put my phone into the GPS holder or a spot, which I put my, my phone. It's this instinctive kind of trigger. Yes. So, and if you walked out of the house without your phone, then you would be reminded by doing that, that you must retrieve your phone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now being aware of these, these aren't sort of good or bad or, or intentional or not, but this is sort of like this underlying psychological pattern which which to be aware of it is really, really powerful. And you can be far more intentional because we can actually use these and we'll go into this, this next set in a minute, but we can use this trigger action pattern to actually sort of brain hack ourselves and do these, do these really cool life hacks. So, so this next section, trigger action plans is exactly that. So we've basically got a four step process and the step is we choose a kind of goal, which is a decided outcome or behavior that we want. Then we identify a trigger which will then trigger that that behavioral pattern or action. And we got to decide on, on what the actual action is that leads to the goal. And so then, and then we got to try and memorize that. And so what we'll do now is again, and a DIY exercise, everyone have a think about and see if you can come up with a, a trigger action plan or a couple of trigger action plans, or it can maybe, maybe if it's something you've already intentionally done, you can, you can write that down and sort of map it out. Or maybe there's something new. And so, so with the trigger action patterns from before, that stuff that we're doing instinctively, maybe, maybe some of that we weren't even realizing we're doing instinctively until you start thinking about it. And so a trigger action plan where we sort of brain hack ourselves into this better desired outcome, they're actually like, like the hint says, they're, they're easiest and effective when we take an existing trigger action and then tweak it slightly and be like, we got this trigger which causes us to do a thing. What if we did something really similar, which was much better, better outcome in our life? So let's let's take another minute or two. Everyone have a think about that and uh, maybe write something down. Okay, I've got a couple of notes here. Um, I could potentially keep going, but does anyone else want to keep working or then wants more time or or shall we start maybe share a little bit what we've got? Amanda, Ellie, how are you guys going? Oh yeah, you... um yeah, I've got I've got one. Um for the... okay. uh, Owen, are you good or you want a bit more time? Uh, I I couldn't think of uh, one that's going to work. I don't think more time's useful though. Okay, fair enough. Well, um, how about how about I I start then sharing mine. So, uh, th those who know anything about me know that I do some I do some hectic fitness. I'm moderately fit. Uh, so I'm, so I'm I'm concerned about my weight. And so I have a problem with snacking, and I'll snack too much sometimes. Put a little bit too much weight. Not like bad, but I just have a have a target I want to maintain. So me sort of opening the fridge and, and snacking all the time. That's a, that's a behavior pattern I've been trying to break. And so, so my goal here would be to snack from the fridge less. And so the trigger would still be that I go near my fridge or kitchen and be like, oh, why don't I check the fridge? But the action could be to open the fridge door and then get myself a glass of water, pour myself a nice, cool, refreshing glass of water. And like, I'm still, I'm still, the pattern is still there, but I'm just sort of tricking myself and, and diverting it. And and it's it's uh, still really pleasant because you know I get thirsty. I go out. It's a hot day. I might be exercising or something, and that's really unpleasant. I like, sort of think about drinking or hydration and associate that with the fridge, and so I sort of get myself into this mindset where instead of being like, "Oh, there's snacks in the fridge," I'll go look in there. I'll be like, "Oh, I go. I'll I'll, I'll still sort of have that in the back of my mind." But I open the fridge, and then suddenly, psych, 
I'm now drinking a glass of water and I'm hydrating because I'm a hydro homie. Does anyone else feel feel confident to share this? Mine's very similar to yours. Um, I work from home and I have worked from home for 10 years. And anytime I stood up from my desk, I would walk to my fridge. I wouldn't just get a snack. I'd get a chocolate. Um, and I ended up putting on a lot of weight. Um, so I worked and I've already put this in place. Um, now when I get up and walk away, I walk to the fridge, but I would just walk and have a look at my calendar instead. And I walk back to my desk and I'm getting exercise and I'm not eating. And I lost 12 kilos like that. So it was pretty, it was just, just from stopping snacking and just doing a little bit more exercise. Um, so yeah, that's worked really well. Yeah. Amazing. So Daryl and Matt, it sounds like you guys are pretty much already doing this then. Yeah, um, yeah. I've, so I've I've got in my I've got in my notes here that um that this technique is also used as part of cognitive behavioral therapy, which I wasn't aware of. But that's pretty cool, and um and it, it and and also that it's it's quite effective for working with ADHD people to to think about this this train of thought and then being intentional about the triggers and the actions that follow through and the feelings as well. And so yeah. so that's really interesting that there's there's this body of cognitive science behind it, and um I can share I've got some references for this as well. But um, this next slide is just some little tips, tips for taps about some ways to think about it. So uh, I guess they're there if anyone wants to go through them. But yeah, if you if you choose sort of triggers that are close to your pre-existing behavioral patterns, so you can subtly redirect them. And the trigger needs to be simple and noticeable. Uh, you're, you also probably want to use these at wink link moments where you're more likely to have problems or high leverage moments. And the actions need to be very, very simple and kind of optional so not like some big massive thing you're like like what's my trigger oh my action is gonna be go for a whole like 10k run or 20k run okay that's a that's a big thing which takes a bit of planning so maybe, maybe an action that's a little bit sort of simpler it makes it easy to get into cb and a thing from cbt um don't make yourself wrong for it don't you know judge yourself you know cruelly for this for needing this it's just a thing you know yeah we work with it we fix it yeah cbt is where i picked it up from because i have PTSD from DV, me and all the acronyms, but um, it's very heavily used in CBT and it can just a small little thing, just recognizing your trigger and re-diverting your, yourself can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, let's go into this next case study, the, uh, the parable of the orange. <laughs> now, sometimes there is no way to get everything and we have to make trade-offs and compromises. But we as human beings have a tendency to feel constrained more than we really are, thanks to long-standing habits, to social imperatives, to assumed entanglements between observations. But often there's a lot of wiggle room, which we're not aware of. So in the parable of the orange, two individuals are at the market and they both reach for the last orange at the fruit stall and have an argument over who'll get it. So on the surface, it kind of feels like a classic A or B situation where the orange will go to one person or the other. And if you were to compromise, like the classic Solomon's choice where he cuts the apple and cuts the orange in half, well, that'll kind of leave both people half satisfied. And both people be a little bit dissatisfied. Um, so what we can do instead, uh, so in the parable, the farmer asks the question, what do you actually want the orange for? And he asked each person. And so the situation changed. So wanting an orange is not the sort of fundamental atomic drive. We actually have reasons why we go out to get the orange in the first place. And that desire is probably going to be what's called instrumental, where it means you are going to get the orange to help you achieve another different goal. So uh, so the two individuals may have wanted it for different reasons, such as eating it, making juice, getting seeds for planting, or using a recipe, any number of possibilities. And in the parable, one of the two buyers wanted to make mulled wine, which requires orange peel whereas the other buyer just wanted to eat it. So now by appropriately dividing the orange, it is actually possible for both buyers to be fully satisfied. So, however, had the farmer not spoken up, the three of them would not have investigated the possibility of a third path, and the situation would have ended with at least one person being disappointed. So this next technique is called goal factoring. And essentially what we're doing is looking at, um, sometimes there is unavoidable trade-offs, but the process is breaking apart a situation to help identify different sort of processes. 
So there's five steps here. Um, what um, I did have it in here for us to go through this and do it again, but it's slightly more complicated. So instead, I'll sort of present this for everyone to have a look and have a think about and feel free to come back and play with it as well. But the idea is that you want to, um, you essentially look at, look at, look at an action or decision and probably something that you is, is fairly complex or which you're a bit hesitant about. And, um, and you've got, you've got potentially trade-offs there. And so think about what are the different goals you achieve, you want to achieve through this action or decision and try and break it apart and see if there are alternate approaches. So I'm going to move on now and a uh, quick slide to talk about a expected value. So this kind of thing, this thing comes out of statistics, but it's a really, really fundamental and simple thing, which is where we can, uh, where we can actually get into some really quite an exciting empirical rational approaches where we start putting to numbers, numbers to things and expected value is super useful and comes up heaps in statistics, but also in, in these kind of rationalist techniques where the way we get it is we multiply the probability of an outcome by the value you gain if that outcome is true. So the example is if you have a 50% coin where if you get a heads, you get $1,000. And if you have roll a tails, if you flip a tails, you get nothing. The expected value is 0 0.5 times 1,000. So you get $500. So there's no reason not to take it. You're, you, you can, based on the probability, you can expect to get about $500. And if you flipped 1,000 coins then the average amount you'd get is $500 for each flip when you average it all out. So this is how we use statistics and a kind of rational approach, which has, has problems. See the problem of induction, which I mentioned super briefly at the start. So it's not perfect, but it does, it is actually a way to, which it is a step up against just sort of, just sort of guessing and working by instinct. So this expected value is super important because it ties into the next big one or the final thing in the workshop, which is the decision tree. Uh, now this, this is a massive process. Uh, there's nine steps here. There is quite a lot involved and it could like doing it sort of thoroughly will probably take a few hours. So instead, what I'd like to do is sort of talk you guys through it and show some examples. So you guys can get an idea and then maybe approach it, uh, come back and think about it and approach it in a more simplified way. And um, maybe we can run another workshop in the future and focus on this one more specifically and, and spend more time on it because um, having these other updates as part of the, the meeting, I think is pretty important, but I'll talk everyone through it. And then maybe, uh, maybe we can stick around for an extra half hour or people can go away and sort of work on it on their own and share later. So as you can see nine steps. Uh, so, so the, the example, which I pulled off the guide here was a person was choosing between doing a PhD, doing a master's, or just keep working out their job, trying to find a better job. And it's a classic decision, which a lot of people, maybe even most people, probably not most, but a lot of people face at some point in their lives or something similar, right? And so, so there's a lot of different sort of factors here. And one, and obviously the big question is, will it make more money? And how much effort is it? How, or how much time do I have to invest into it? And, and the, another big consideration is, does it give me more options for things to do? And so obviously... If you're going to go off and upskill and get your master's or PhD, you have more options and you're probably going to have more earning potential, but there'll be a lot of time invested. So, so you're sort of looking at these. So your decision is what do I do for my career next? Do I do a job? Do I get a job? Do I do a master or a PhD? And then you break apart all the different options and all the different potential outcomes. So like you, you, let's say you get a job at better constraints, your potentials and you earn less money that's like the worst outcome possible right or, or no sorry the worst outcome is phd where you you actually get less options and you earn less but you invest huge amounts of time so 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 that would be the worst possible outcome becoming a professor the best possible outcome is if you jump into a job <laughs> this is a hypothetical because you could actually do your phd and you could somehow breeze through it with no effort and hypothetically breeze through it with no effort and then have this massive paying job at the end of it that's possible Maybe it's very unlikely, but it's possible. So, so you need to look at all of these different possible outcomes. And part of that is looking at the outcomes, looking at the different variables, which is the uncertainty. And so the next and um, step four is you're ranking these in order. And again, I encourage them to go and look through all the nine steps and then have a think about giving this a go. It is an involved process and probably want to use a spreadsheet as well. But um, you're at step four, we're ranking it. 
in terms of what is your most desirable to least desirable. So you can see, uh, so the best desirable outcome here is the one where you increase your money, it expands your options, and there's a low time invested. Miles, was so that... I assume, I think that one was, sorry, go on. Quick question. Um, was that algorithmic or did you just do it by feel? Great question. Uh, very important question. And it is dealt with very thoroughly in a full workshop. And the answer is a combination of both. So there are processes you can use, but ultimately this is a decision-making process for you. So it has to, it really should feel right. It should be feel intuitively right. And actually we can sort of, just to sort of skip ahead <laughs> to step nine reflection, you'll get one outcome, which is statistically the best, but if it feels wrong, then the odds are you've actually, you've, you've, you've kind of, you, you've probably unintentionally, but you've done one of the previous steps incorrectly and you, you've sort of, so I'll, I'll quickly go through the other steps just to give an example of how. So we've ranked the outcomes here and, and step five is you actually put a number to them. So in this case, it's zero to a hundred. And so obviously high options, low time investment, high money, hundred, give me a hundred bucks, baby. But if you've got low money, low options, high time investment, we don't want any of that. That's the worst possible option. So thinking back before to the expected value, this is where it comes in. So, cause we're gonna look at probabilities soon. So essentially we build a tree which shows all these different outcomes and ranked by time. So in this case is the PhD and your two options are more money, less money, and it splits. And then the next, the next possible split is more options or less options for your career. So again, it splits. And then the, the final critical variables it's called is, is there a high invest time investment or a low time investment? So it splits again. And so quite simply it's zero through to hundred. And, uh, and so you can see like the most desirable one is the top, obviously with a hundred value, the least desirable is zero at the bottom. You don't want that at all. And just to sort of quickly go back to, um, so, so the next step is to assign probabilities and you can probably see where this is going, but you look at, and, and this is where it kind of flips between vibe based versus number based. And so you want to do your best to determine the probability of each of these outcomes, right? So PhD in this example, the author said, okay, there's 80% chance I'm going to earn more money. If I get a PhD, 20% chance I'm not right. Fair enough. Okay. And that, that, that's sort of tricky. But that's something you've got to sort of work through and, and do your best to figure out. And there's techniques you can learn as well, which I won't go into, but there are there are techniques which which are taught to help sort of work this through. And so then uh and so then the other thing you want to look at and is the probabilities for each of these, each of these potential splits. And you'll notice for time invested, they're all zero percent or hundred percent. And and the reason why that is, it's similar to why you go zero to a hundred. It's uh it's a little bit of a simplification, but it's a really powerful one where if we go back to step three here is where you group the different sets of outcomes into a few main categories. And so there's del you're deliberately simplifying them a bit to try and work out what's called a qualitative difference where it's not a numbers-based difference. It's not slightly more or slightly less, but it's is one more or is one less? It's, it is like like opposites, right? And And so you can see here, they're broken down into two sort of opposites, more money, less money, more options, less options, more time invested, less time invested. And so, uh, and so you assign your probabilities as best you can. Then step eight, you calculate your expected value. And so this is where this is, um, this is the mathy bit, but it's, it's pretty basic maths. And, and just like the slideshow before you, you essentially work backwards. You multiply the value by the probability. So starting from, so starting from the top right here under time invested, we've got, so for the perfect outcome, you get a PhD, more money, expands your options and there's low time invested. Well, in this case, there's a 0% chance of that one. So that's sad, but that's what the person decide. However, there's a, there's going to be a high amount of time invested. And this is the second most desirable option. So our outcome. So. So the expected value comes out to 95 because it's hundred percent times 95 and then you multiply it backwards. So we've got a 60% chance of expanding options times 95, which comes down to a value of 63. However, if we go back to time invested and we look at the um, constrained options, we can see there's a there's still a hundred percent chance of high time invested, but a 0% chance of low time invested. 
And based on the value order before, then based on these outcomes, you can see there's an expected value of 15 from that. And so it tracks back and you, you sort of go back and you add them up each time. And once you get back to the starting node PhD, you get the total expected value of taking this decision. So in this case, it was 52.8. And so what in this example, what the author did was did that for PhD as well as masters, as well as doing a job. And on this next slide, you can see the full decision tree for each of those decisions. And so you can see the different probabilities, the different values, and the final score, the highest score is obviously the best. So 52.8 for PhD, getting a new job, 43, getting a master's, 66.76. So based on this algorithm, the master's is the statistically best choice. Hmm. So I wonder, you can, Miles, you... um, with these examples, um, you know, obviously we have to do a lot of guessing the probabilities. Um, yeah, I wonder what are your thoughts, um, you know, as a software engineer, when I see this, I think, um, you know, if the government wants to help people's lives, the lives of its citizens, you know, could the Bureau of Statistics, could um, the tax department be publishing a lot of this data, make it easily available through, you know, APIs, through chatbots, that sort of thing. Like, you know, if you go to Wolfram Alpha, he can say like, um, you know, what's the population of Australia? What's the likelihood of getting hit by lightning? Uh, so therefore, you know, like um, it, it knows lots of facts and figures. And so um, <laughs> I, I remember a scenario in um, when we were studying user interfaces and that user experience, they said that um, the measurements of like uniforms for Australian soldiers um, there wasn't good ergonomic data about like the typical height and weight of an Australian. So at the end of the day, you know, our army is getting uniforms that might not fit. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like if, if we were to provide as much of this data as like easily accessible as possible, helping citizens, you know, make big choices in their lives. I mean, I see that as like, if the government can do it and they just don't, they just say too hard, um, we would have mm. to hire software engineers to do that. Then I think, you know, the government's dropping the ball. Um, mm. Big data. Yeah. Mm. Not just medical, yeah. but everything. Mm. Yeah. You so see as well, that, actually. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Well, no, that's a really interesting comment. And um, I, I, I broadly agree with the sentiment, but there's a few, uh, there's, a, there's a few ethical considerations I want to bring forward. So at step nine here is reflecting on the outcome because obviously it, in, in we, we were in this example they worked out the masters was statistically the best choice hmm. overall based on the probabilities. Hmm. So, but but the thing is you might go through this pro process and you might work out statistically best choice and um and this author they did an interview on it the, the guy who developed this process he did an interview on it and the example he used was he had to travel across the country to get his. One of the options of the PhD was traveling across the country to a university pretty far away. It would mean he'd have to leave, leave his girlfriend. And he he got to this point in the process where he'd calculated and he, he was reflecting on it. And he's like, oh God, I can't do that. He didn't want to travel across the country because he'd leave he'd be leaving his girlfriend. And he realized, hang on a second, I've I've put the wrong value or the wrong probabilities on some steps. He had to go back. He went back and he redid it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a really important um, I, I think a really important moral point there as well that we we can come in we can say here's the data here is clearly the best option statistically but the thing is that will feel wrong to some people that won't feel right to some people almost inevitably and so uh, and, and so this this gets really complex and contextually but morally we need to think really, really carefully whether we can force people to do certain things if it's statistically best, because we won't have the same information that they have. We might have a, we might have all the data in the world, but we don't we can't see inside people's brains. We can't sort of record inside people's brains. And there's a really important point from a democratic perspective where we have to be able to respect people's individuality and um and 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 self identity and, and self agency in order to express who and what they want to be and do in the world, and that was a really important as a really important but a sort of subtle philosophical point behind youth justice reform that Ed's campaigning for in Inala as well, which is to support people to have agency and under our punitive criminal criminal justice system, 
uh, people who fall into into that cycle of getting into prison and um and maybe they reoffend and they're sent back to prison then that in, in that case we are we're not just in, s- directly stripping agency by sending them to prison but then they we are also putting them into a cycle where they then lose agency in future because in some cases if let's say there's a really horrible culture in prison where they actually increase their in, increase their um antisocial attitudes or behaviors they they engage in more cr- criminal behavior more antisocial behavior just by being in that environment and so and so we need to we need to be thinking about what is the what is the agency what is the individual input into this decision and i think like uh, to give to to look at it from an economic context um there's a, there's a classic thing that happens in australia everyone here has probably experienced this um we've massive amounts of international students mostly asian um largely chinese coming over and the large well, a huge portion of them are studying medicine and most of the rest are doing something like pharmacy or law or maybe engineering and these are really high paying professions they're deliberately seeking out high paying professions and choosing the most direct route to get to it and so because they're like oh money good right and yeah 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 sure diminishing returns but in general money can can be good for most people with caveats with conditions whatever but um but the things which maybe aren't being considered when you purely choose a high value career is it's a lot of time invested just like in this example huge time invested but also are you going to enjoy it are you going to feel fulfilled by it is yeah. there um and if you're an international student you're changing cultures you're changing languages quite often you're moving across the world losing all your support networks these are huge issues which are which are deeply personal and so we as the government could say uh we as the hypothetical government could say oh yeah the um we want everyone to to be prosperous and financially independent therefore everyone should just go for the highest paying job but that's not going to work <laughs> for for um for for a lot of reasons but on an individual level it's not going to work because most people won't be suited or, or won't really enjoy most jobs or won't be able to su- to succeed and thrive in most jobs and like pure and from an economic perspective obviously it's ludicrous if we get everyone to do the same job then it, society won't work it'll collapse <laughs> So, so, so obviously the market-based response to that is that it'll just sort of shuffle things around, but in that process of shuffling things around and adapting, a lot of people get lost in the process and people get hurt in the process. They get harmed exactly physically, socially, mentally. And so, uh, and, and so, you know, we can, we can look at this very basic calculation, which is like, go out and get the highest paying job, but, but, but what about all these other considerations? Yeah, I yeah, think you're what circling. if you go out and study for six years and sorry, yes, you're right. I am I am sort of circling, but sorry, I guess that's what a... Miles on that point, um, you know, in terms of get the getting the best job, you know, for engineering, for medicine, for law, um, it, sure the average might be high, but you know, it's super competitive. If your heart isn't in it, if you're putting in, you know, six hour days and you know, just bullshitting, just trying to cruise by, like, you know, how are you ever gonna move up the career ladder? You're always you know, going to be like a, a second rate, you know, lawyer, engineer, whatever. Um, so yeah, you know, like going, going, yeah, as you say, something you enjoy, I, I think as well, you know, it makes me think of universal basic income, how, yes. um, you know, people aren't pressured yeah. into making these short-term decisions. People can choose yeah. something that yeah. truly makes them happy, that benefits society that might not yeah. have a GDP number attached to it. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so important. And, and, um, and, even if hypothetically we had UBI, people would still be making choices and 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 be weighing these trade offs. Yeah, so that was like some, time invested. That was what I wanted to say that you were circling towards an argument for UBI. But another good one is a lottery win. Um, if I won the lottery, I would keep washing dogs. Why? Because I love washing dogs. You know, I get up every day. I feel like you know going to work. I look forward to it. I don't mind working six days a week. I I'd probably be a little happier if I worked five or four, but I love what I do. If I didn't, I'd do something else. So Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this has been Applied Rationality for Fusion Party. I hope everyone got something out of it. Uh, I'm quite happy to stay and sort of discuss a little bit longer, mm. but um, but this is a quite an advanced process. There's nine steps. And I would, uh, I'd love to hear if anyone does want to step through this process, please feel free to, the guide is here. I've also linked 
Um, I put references and further reading on this slide here. Um, the the step by step guide that I've sort of summarized over these here is this one right at the end, Guild of the Rose. And I'll give want to give them a plug as well as they run. They have regular monthly workshops and provide heaps and heaps of uh, training materials. Most of it or all of it, I think, is actually free online. But it's far more beneficial to actually go through this with a cohort or with a group, and um and test and apply these. And uh, going back to sort of the, the why of what this is, the why of rationalism, then I heard a really good, uh, really good explanation or definition from it about a week or two ago, which is that rationalism is about uh, removing the illusions in our lives so we can have a more accurate view of the world around us. And, uh, and, and, and sort of thinking back about the inductive fallacy or the problem of induction where we can't be certain, like a pattern isn't proof the pattern will continue but we can we can put a percentage value on it and say, look, I feel comfortable saying there's like going to be like an eighty percent chance the sun will rise tomorrow. Therefore, I'm going to hang my washing out to dry. Yeah, that is cool. I love that. <laughs> That's like um, you know, it's self help, but applied to the intellectual rather than the emotional axis. Yeah, yeah, but um, but it, at, at, but just sort sort of. Uh, I think it's really important not to lose that emotional aspect as well, and that's why a lot of this rationalist techniques. Um, earlier will be about we, we'll we'll include that vibe based aspect for it like does this feel right does this feel wrong um, or or sort of like brain hacking different little behavioral habits. I, I wonder actually, Miles, on that point of um you know making your life oh well, what were you saying sorry like if you become more rationalist like um I, I'm thinking you know horoscopes for instance there mm. must be some nagging feeling in these people's minds oh well sorry I, I, i'm sort of presuming they're incorrect but um i mean that that is the popular perception but i guess yeah what what would you say about the people following the horoscopes where everyone else says like this is clearly bullshit but if it makes this person happy uh, like who's the victim mm -hmm. well what we um in when we're doing statistics we look at um we look at we'll look at a bunch of different events and look at the, and, and then try to predict the probability based on previous history. And, and, and the main technique for doing that will essentially say, um, for, for anyone who's following at home, it's calculating P value and doing a, a, a T test calculated P value. And you, you essentially say, what is the chance that this actually, there's actually a pattern here or it's purely random chance. And for horoscopes, Odds are you do enough of them, it's going to be purely random chance. So doing a horoscope will be no different to not doing a horoscope you, or, or you, like basing your decisions off it, essentially. And so I know that's not really how horoscopes work, but but essentially analogous to it. So um, it's it's purely random to, to be sort of uh, to generalize about or simplify it a bit. So, so, so why would people do it then? And I mean... There might be a whole heap of reasons. Off the top of my head, um, it could be cultural. Maybe they had a family or friends who did it, and they did. It, they just keep doing it because it's because of that. Maybe it makes them feel good, you know. And then that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. Alignment. Um, there's there's a strong argument under. Sure. Yeah. Self identity as well. Like I identify as a Taurus, therefore I will seek to embody these per these behavioral aspects, and um and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That a lot of the horoscope traits. Um, you know, bravery, courage, compassion, empathy, just whatever. Most of these, pretty much all the traits in the horoscope are positive. And, and you wouldn't you wouldn't go wrong by trying to, at least in moderation, embody a lot of those traits. Yeah, alignment is important too. It, if, it is better to have everybody following one, you know, one plan, even if that plan is suboptimal, than to have a whole bunch of people following a whole a bunch of different plans. Yeah, definitely. If you're trying movement, to get yeah, Sorry, I wonder as that? well, actually, um, in terms of, I guess, you know, if you're going to set a life goal, then, um, you know, fortune cookies and horoscopes, as you say, Miles, they're, they're often positive. If I'm thinking, should I study a PhD? Oh, yeah, you know, go for it, the fortune cookie says. Um, and the, a similar thing is, um, have you guys heard, I, I forget the name of the, the disease, but it's pretty common in um, the population for humans, cats, um, I think it starts with like fish and rats. Basically, it makes them less 
fear averse. So, you know, rats and fish will spend more time out in the open, get caught by a predator, a cat, and then somehow it Toxo, ends up... Toxoplasmosis. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that's the name. Yeah. So I, I think it's in about um, half a percent of humans. And so it makes you um, more willing to take risks, but unfortunately it slows your reaction times as well. So I guess, you know, it gets you caught by predators. And yeah, and, I remember. Oh, Daryl, yeah. Sorry. Um, and they found it in the blood of motorcycle accident victims more frequently than the average. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. The probably... scenario I was going to mention was um they gave a, a talk i think it was in britain about um being an entrepreneur starting a startup and yeah they found it was much more common anyone who attended the startup talk was more likely to to have this <laughs> this risk aversion oh sorry the, but um interestingly i would love to see the results like was it correct for these people to do the startups like yes they were more willing to start them but also mm-hmm. what was their success rate i mean it's pretty mm-hmm low normally but um i guess you know same as the horoscopes if it was pushing them saying like you're going to succeed in this risky action is it you know doing them a disservice or is it like the secret if you just believe in it like that is the crux of um actually well, that, getting it done the secret and so forth is harnessing um uh, what's it called um confirmation bias in your favor so if you're focused on you know whatever it is becoming an entrepreneur of some kind um and you then visualize it and you know do your um do your diagrams and affirmations and all that sort of thing it's good it's puts it to the forefront of your mind and you then you know you're very aware of opportunities to progress your goal whereas which you otherwise may ignore had you not done the work so there's that um, but also that toxoplasmosis, it makes me wonder if that might be an effective treatment for a neurosis and risk aversion, unhealthy oh, levels yeah. of risk aversion. Maybe, you know, expose them to a little bit of cat poo. <laughs> yeah, it could be. That's how they used to do vaccines. Mm-hmm. Scrape the scrape the pus out of uh, smallpox sores and, and feed it. Yeah, of... hookworm. Hookworm. Apparently catching hookworm um, is, if not curative, at least helpful to a couple of dietary allergies so so in this case what we would do is look at the probability of something good versus something bad mm. and be like okay well what are the chances here what is the good what is the bad dying of smallpox is pretty pretty bad even just catching smallpox is ex- extremely painful yeah. so in that case m- maybe it's not so bad to do something horrifying and disgusting if it means that you significantly reduce your chance of of, of dying of this really painful disease yeah, cowpox, which is awful, but nowhere near as awful and nowhere near as fatal. So that was his original um, method. Shoot him up with cowpox as a vaccination for smallpox. Yeah. Amazing. Well, that's 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 the process of science. <laughs> it uh, gets a little easier every time. And um, I think there's a there's a great uh, a great rationalist technique as well related to that, which um just going back to the the, the therapy angle before, um that there, there was this this other uh, researcher who found that that the the people who tended to get the most out of therapy were ones with high amounts of uncertainty because as they were talking through something they would be uh, trying to explain a sequence of events they might have a lot of uncertainty about it so they might be correcting themselves or, yeah. or or sort of changing their or, or changing as their recollection changed or their memory changed and um and they would because of this willingness to update, um, update their understanding of things, of, of outcomes or, or or processes, then, um, then yeah, they'd have these these better outcomes in therapy. And so there's a similar kind of analogy as well for these rationalist techniques that, um, that as uh, that you want to be you want to be iterating on them and, and repeatedly. And so so this decision tree is it's meant to be a process for making decisions. So there's probabilities there. And so like in, in theory, it could be used to, to, to predict outcomes. But the thing is you, you already have, you already have these predictions. You already have the, essentially you already have the, the data to, to assign these probabilities and these values. Maybe you want to do some research. Sure. That's, that's fine, but it's already there. And it's the process for you to sort of go step through it and systematize it in a way, which then says, Oh, well, this, Based on my analysis, this is the best outcome. This one out of the three. 
And so, but maybe your maybe your probabilities were wrong. Maybe your values were wrong. And so it's super helpful to be able to test things and then update and then iterate and update. And I've tried to do the same thing in fusion campaigns as well, where we'll 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 try something in one campaign. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. We'll try it a little bit different in the next campaign, or we'll try something a little bit different and, and see how that works or that doesn't. And then try and record that data from campaign to campaign. And so we've got we've got a lot of data. We've got a lot of um, for each of the campaigns we've run. We've got a lot of documentation saying the things we did and how we did and how they turned out. And I also make a a, a big point about writing a reflection after each campaign too. And I've been encouraging everyone involved too. So so Owen, maybe if you want to write a small reflection for for Dunkley. Yeah. Uh, oh, for uh, Dunkley's, it's not too much to say, but I did an election. Oh, I, I did one for Aston, actually. Um, mm. Yeah, I'll include that in the next newsletter. Um, people aren't mm. necessarily going to come to these meetings and talk about being a candidate, but yeah, Miles, I'll collect all the, um, um, you know, the, the post candidate reflections, and so people can read through that and see, um, you know, firsthand, like was it so daunting and all that? What were the actual challenges? Yeah. <laughs> My, my my reflection for your Aston campaign was thirty thousand words, so that's a casual read. <laughs> so that that must be one of the shorter ones for you, isn't it, Mars? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I was working people... for a month. I was I was like, I was locked on. It took me a month to write that. It was, it yeah. was... Hmm. no, I I really appreciate your help, your what you did in the campaign, though. Yeah, it's um, yeah. <clears throat> So political consultancy is your future career path, Mark? Something, a commun- something in community organizing or maybe campaign managing. I, I, um, I've i got this growing understanding of the last few years that I don't want to work in a career just for money. Um, making a lot of money would be nice, but I'm mm. living, I've been living fairly cheaply for a while. I'm, quite, I'm fairly happy with that. Uh, at times where I need to make more money, I have done, I will do so in the future. But um, there's in in the effective altruism movement, there's there's a there's there's one concept where you can go out and do what's called earning to give, which is where you aim to make the most money in the world, and then you donate that to causes that you care about. And so that's a way that you can, if you're really good at making lots of money, that's a way you can be really effective at doing good in the world. And that's not for everyone, but but that's a legitimate career choice, which a lot of people make within effective altruism circles. Counter argument to that is indulgences, like the um, Catholic Church used to sell. And um, mm. and also, you know, if you're doing something that makes you miserable, um, you can't necessarily completely fungibly, you know, turn that into feeling good about yourself just because you bought off, you know, you bought a thousand yeah, exactly. kids a meal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a really good criticism, but um, but like the we we live in a society where money gives access to resources, and so in that sense getting access to those resources can lead to doing direct good. And so like there's a, yeah. um, there's, there's a, there's this meme critiquing internet socialism where um, it's kind of like a stereotype, the stereotype of a, a, a vegan hipster in Starbucks typing on a iMac and a iPhone. You guys probably heard the meme and, um, and it's like, you, you, like you're indulging all the products of capitalism, but calling yourself a socialist, which feels hypocritical, but the um the, the the reality of this stereotype is that while there might be an element of truth to it, it's really hard not to participate in society and participate in capitalism because it's so all encompassing. So in that sense, it's like we can try and we can try and do good, but to a certain extent, we don't have many options to avoid doing things which might be undesirable or might have some negative impacts. You know, like like me me going out and snacking on heaps of chocolate, or, or like Amanda was doing snacking on chocolate. Like yes, it has it, it like it it'll we'll, we'll put on a bit of weight, but it does feel good in the short term. It can help give us a little mood boost and and just sort of push through for having a rough day, you know. So so there's good there and there's bad there. Yeah, Daryl, I was thinking of exactly that meme. So so Daryl's just posted in chat the um. Yeah, I, I won't read it out, but I'll I'll try and hopefully we can. Mr. Gotcha, it's called. Oh, uh, I'm not sure I get this. Sorry, Daryl. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, refusal to participate in, for example, capitalism is not really an option available to any of us at our level. Um, but mm. a critique of, of capitalism 
you know, there's a counter argument. Oh, sorry. It said yet you participate. Sorry. I thought it said yes. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. The dude in the well is your stereotypical internet libertarian. Mm. You know, how dare you criticize capitalism and yet you have a job. How dare you live in society, but criticize society at the same time. That's yeah, super cool. I noticed it was very similar. The um, the I was chatting with the labor people at the um, the booth the other day, and um, it, it was fascinating actually. I finally got more sense of their insight. Um, so I, I was criticizing jobs at the time, saying that most people's jobs are meaningless, it makes them unhappy, and that labor's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. And um, yeah, you know, this guy was saying like, oh well, you know, if you want to change the system completely, you know, like we're trying to make an immediate difference to the cost of living and all that. And actually, um, Miles, I'm not sure if you were familiar with this. They he started talking about some philosopher. I think he called it he- Hegelian yeah, philosophy. Hegel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so he mentioned um, the there's this like paradox where yeah. the worker notices that he. Oh, you're familiar with this? A libertarian quoting Hegel. This, yeah, this, this was this was a labor guy. This is a, a labor supporter. Um, oh, um, much more sense. Okay. A unionist. Yeah, <laughs> and so Hegel. he was saying. Um, you know, the, the worker realizes that, you know, he's giving power to the master and that the master is extracting all this. But then he also realizes that the master only gets anything because the workers are putting in all the work. And so that sense that, like, this worker is the source of all this power, just that acknowledgement, therefore, gives the mm. worker this power. Um, mm. I think it's a bit, um, it reminds me a lot of Epicurus, you know, the how you your mindset of the situation choosing happiness is an option happiness isn't um just something that must happen in these circumstances it's you know your choice as well stoicism Um, there's another yes yes um but i i think you know the i don't know it still feels like a bit of a glib anecdote i mean like there's no denying that many people's jobs are shit it makes them unhappy Mm. If, especially if they're working three dead end jobs, you know, juggling the hours and all that, um, to tell these people like, oh, but you give, you know, your shift supervisor his power, like, so what? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm actually I'm I'm actually quite familiar with that concept. It's called epistemic privilege, and uh, okay, the the idea is that um, let's hypothetically say that there's there's only two kinds of people. There's the worker and then and there's the the business owner, and the business owner can see can see worker being productive, making products, and the products getting sold and then money being made and the money going into his pocket. Whereas the worker can can see all of that, but the worker can also uh, also see their own perspective, which is that maybe they're getting underpaid, maybe they're getting overworked, maybe they're struggling to put food on the table. So the worker has what's called epistemic privilege because they can see both sides, but the business owner can only see their own perspective. And so um, Marx quite famously used that as the basis for his his concept of the the um, the dialectic of the oppressed, or where you you differentiate between the working class and the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie. And and so it's it's sort of the fundamental philosophical basis which Marx um, and Lenin and Engels later on would mostly actually Lenin and, and and Engels would then argue that the worker that the the worker is is fundamentally morally correct because they have more information they can see all these perspectives so they can actually make a better judgment from seeing more 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 of more of this more of this perspective so epistem an episteme is uh, essentially a world worldview or a um a structure of knowledge and so and so in this case the worker or uh, in the older hegelian perspective the, the oppressed person has a privileged or a better epistemy because it's broader and more encompassing. Yeah, actually it reminds me, um, you know, you see in the US, for instance, um, wait staff have to burden more of the entrepreneurial risk. Um, mm. So, you know, you could say, well, they have firsthand knowledge of, you know, what makes the customers happy mm. and all this. But um, I, I guess, the, you know, saying that they have this greater wisdom by seeing, you know, everything that's going on, you know, they have to still be able to step back and see the forest for the trees. You know, someone has decided to stump up their cash, take the entrepreneurial risk in terms of, you know, naming the restaurant, buying a portion of land, choosing what hours it will be open. Um, and then, yeah, the wait staff are expected to absorb 
all this entrepreneurial risk for many of the decisions they didn't make. Um, and I, sorry, why I say they're absorbing the risk is because, you know, they get paid their minimum wage is something like $4 an hour. They're meant mm. to make their actual money from tips, but you know, they have so little control over the tips. Um, and so I guess, you know, if you told some of these American wait staff employees, you know, you have, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The paradox of privilege or what we were calling yeah, it before. Privilege. Yeah. Like, you know, they would probably say, so what? I'd, I'd rather have more money than um, some yeah, epistemiology. So yeah. It, it, it's a pretty, is a, it's a fairly esoteric philosophical point, but, but essentially what, what you, what idea, what in theory, what people would take away from it is that the perspective of the worker is a more accurate worldview. Mm. Oh, you okay. see as yeah, you see as well. Though sometimes they undermine what's best for the customers. You know the um, I mean in Australia, for instance, you know with the responsible service of alcohol laws, um, you know you might get a customer asking you, you know, please give me another beer, and you can see like they're falling asleep at the table, they're falling off, they're gambling too much, um, and yeah, when I used to deal blackjack, I remember having to kick one guy out, and you know I felt bad that I was spoiling his night, but also like you know, the guy just couldn't keep it together. Um, if I had mm. let him stay, you know, is he going to lose a lot more money? Is he going to, you know, divorce his wife um, versus yeah. in the US, you know, they have no problem. I remember seeing, um, yeah, like some guy, uh, he was asleep at the bar, woke up, grabbed someone else's drink, went to start drinking it. And, you know, the 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 um, waitress, you know, just laughed it off like, huh, he got the wrong drink, silly, you know, Mr. Whoever, like, no, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have been serving him 50 drinks all day that he gets to this point, but you know, she gets a tip based on how much he orders. And, yeah. It's, yeah. It's kind of a crucible of all against all, isn't it? The mm, American system. Doggy that, dog. Yeah. yeah they, they see each other as meat on the hoof and it's money rather than meat. What they can claw out of another one mm. and stuff into Thank, themselves. Yeah. Thank God it's not quite as bad in Australia, but you know, it does seem to be heading that way. Resist tipping. Don't let the tipping culture come oh, here. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for coming, everyone. Let's uh, let's think about start bringing it to a close. Does anyone want to bring up any more topics or revisit anything quickly before we? Always, but no. <laughs> it's it's good to have uh, finite and bounded experiences that. Uh, that um, you, can, you can be intentional about things. And that's what, another rational technique I've been exploring called resolve cycles, where you set up a timer and say, I'm just going to push through and make a decision. I'm just going to do try and do this thing and get as far as I can. Yeah, or you can but, flip a coin. Heads, I go to New Zealand. Tails, I go to Canada. I flip the coin. I discover it come up heads. Oh, I don't actually want to go to New Zealand. I think I'll go to Canada. There you go. Yeah, I like that analogy. Yeah. I think, um, hey, Miles, for the for the next monthly meeting, I'm thinking we, mm -hmm. let's, um, we can schedule a chat about uh, philosophy <laughs> going into this <laughs> more in depth. <laughs> that, yeah. I would love that. That would be very exciting. It might be a bit exclusive. Um, not everyone is into that stuff, but I know there's enough people who probably will be keen for it. So yeah. Yeah, start an maybe. SIG. SIG within the party, you know? <laughs> yeah. okay. The idea of these monthly meetings is that um, they're meant to be a fairly accessible topic. So maybe we could look at a few ideas um, and and do start to explore some surface level stuff without getting too deep. There's five people here. I mean, it should be fairly round tabley. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, okay. Let's, uh, well, okay. Let's thanks, guys. I'll stop the recording. Yeah. <clears throat>